Hello. All right, so I don't really do uh, unboxings typically, but uh, I just got in the door and it's here on the porch, so I figure why not? So let's crack it open here. So as with um, the SD40s, they give you their full catalog here. Oop. Guess they're running some sales. They're doing a uh, another run of tier fours that so says uh, early 2018. So if you missed out on this run, good excuse to uh, get in for the next one. Receipt. Um, let's see here. Oh, they sent these little decals along. That's pretty cool. And what you're really here for the model itself. So the scheme that I got was the uh, it's a fictional scheme, the uh, ScaleTrains.com scheme. I got it because I didn't really have a need for any of the other tier four schemes that were out there. Um, probably the only one that I had a real need for would have been BNSF, but they were actually already sold out of them. I have plenty of Union Pacific, um, might have been able to use a Canadian National Unit. Um, I have CSX already, and I obviously have a ton of Norfolk Southern stuff, so no real need for that. So, I thought the color was really cool on this one, I kind of like these one-off fantasy schemes a lot of times. So, we'll take a look to see what we got here. Got your manual here. CVs, uh, again, very similar to the SD40 stuff. Thinner foam. And kind of the industry standard of packaging these days for most locomotives. So you'll have a sleeve that comes off here and then the actual model itself. Which, just taking a look at it here, I'm kind of instantly falling in love with this red. It's a really, really bright red. It's almost like a neon red. And there's a little plastic baggie here. Not really sure what these are. I have to look in there. There we go. I can immediately notice that there's a uh, pretty good weight here. Come on, autofocus there. Now I seem to be having problems with my camera. Now, I'm going to pause this for a second here because obviously I want to be able to show this properly. So I want to give you some close-ups here of the engine. Now 
And that's real cool back there. You got that see-through. And a really nice touch. Got the little scale trains up there on the Chevron. In the year 2017. So I'll show a little bit of the back there. Really, really cool looking engine. So I'm going to try a little experiment here using my phone for this part because I think it captures audio a lot better than what my uh, new digital camera does. And plus I'm having some issues with it right now. But fortunately I do have a tripod now, so I think this will still go pretty well. So we're going to apply track power here. And I'm assuming they have this programmed to address 3, we'll see. Yep. Guess I have to start the engine and actually turn on some of the functions here. Because the number boards aren't turning on. I'm guessing that like the SD40 they'll start with engine. Yep. Immediately I notice a few things here. Uh, one, the startup file sounds a little bit different than what the uh, other uh, Tier 4 that I've gotten previously from Intermountain. So I'll try to get it in frame here. The BNSF, which I did in the previous video. Um, also, one other thing I'm noticing is there is a slight bit of bleed through on the front door there, which, uh, if I'm looking, uh, towards the left side as I kind of come over this way and look straight in, I can actually see part of the bulb there, so that I think I'm going to have to take the shell off and black out. Not a huge deal as long as the shell comes off fairly easily. So we'll run through some of the sounds here. Typical e-bell. Same horn as what uh, is used by Intermountain. Coupler clank. Dynamic brake. Yeah, I'm on F4. Your F5 controls your uh, some of the lighting there. F7, I'm not really sure what that does on here. I'd have to take a look at the manual, but I'm not going to do that right now. And of course, I'm sure it does have full throttle on it. So we'll go ahead and hit F9 for the drive hold and rev it up here. So it's starting to rev up there. Then we'll run it back down the neutral there. Take off F9 here. It does also appear that the ditch lights are set to flash. And that's something you can turn off through CVs also. 
I do notice that the sound doesn't appear to be quite as loud as what the BNSF is, so I'm going to try to turn that up right now, and we'll see if they have that set to max. Not hearing any shell rattle, which is pretty good. So on lock sound, to turn the volume up all the way, you want to hit CV32 to 1 first. And then I believe it's CV63, 192 is the max. We'll go ahead and hit that now. And that definitely is a little bit louder now. And I'll post those CVs again, but that's pretty similar to the SD40 that they had uh, where it wasn't maxed out as far as the volume out of the box. So that's right on par with the uh, Intermountain. Uh, one difference in this one, of course, um, is in the Intermountain video, I did find shell rattle. This is not rattling at all. So we'll go ahead and uh, work with the motor a little bit here. We'll back it up. A little bit different prime mover sound. We'll take a run by here with uh, no sound check for motor noise what about the third throttle there reason to be quiet and then there's some momentum built into this here I'm going to back it up here. Get back here. So I'll go ahead and turn the sound back on. And as soon as that comes back on, we'll go ahead and do a top speed test here. And see what kind of speeds we're hitting here. So we'll go ahead and crank it up. It may take a loop or two before it reaches top speed. Well, gotta hit the right direction here. Should be moving pretty well by the time it gets back around. Sixty six there. Typically, I prefer my diesels run at at least seventy miles an hour so that it can match everything else in my fleet. If it's faster, I always turn it back. I forget offhand what the Intermountain hit, but it was faster than seventy miles an hour. Sixty seven. And this is the very first that I've run this engine, so there's been no break-in time. 
generally as engines break in that uh, pick up a little bit of speed. Eight miles an hour. Seventy two, there we go. That's good enough. So we'll go ahead and bring it around back to a stop here. Probably not going to stop in time, so we'll do a little dynamic braking here. There we go. So a couple other things here too, um, as far as the LEDs, uh, I'll have to compare them side by side with the Intermountain here to see which one really seems to be the brightest. So we're gonna go ahead and put the Intermountain Tier 4 on the track here, right next to it. I don't know about you, but I can pretty much tell right off the bat that the Intermountain is brighter. Definitely. The scale trains kind of looks more like incandescence almost. So I gotta say that the LEDs I do prefer on the Intermountain a little bit better. Now, my Intermountain does have some speaker modifications to it, so it is a little touch louder than what it was originally when I first got it. So, kind of an unfair comparison on that part. So, if you've watched most of my comparison videos, you've kind of come to expect this next part here, which is going to be who's the pulling champion here. So, we're going to do a little tug of war. Put them both at speed step one. Pretty much a draw. Oh, scale trains is inching ahead a little bit. We'll go up to speed step ten. So, pretty safe to say that Scale Trains is walking away with it. So, we'll go into some final comparison thoughts here next, which I think I've pretty much covered on most of the normal details that I take a look at with a new engine. And uh, mainly the focus of this video is to be uh, how it really compares to the Intermountain Tier 4. So for our next comparison here, we're going to take a look at some details. Uh, first thing that I notice right away is that my uh, front area here is kind of crooked. And also the plow is uh, massively undersized compared to the Intermountain. Also the MU cables, I think, look a little bit better on the Intermountain. I'll let you see there just kind of head on you can see that the railings are just kind of that way so that that doesn't look so good there also very importantly on the BNSF here properly it has this blacked out just as it should taking a look at the uh, top of it here now these are not the same model we're comparing a fantasy unit up against an actual uh, road specific detail unit here so not everything is going to be identical but you can see sort of 
some slight differences in the radiator section there. But both very, very close. Also some wavy handrail here on scale trains, whereas my Intermountain was uh, pretty straight. One other detail that I'm noticing here on this is that my ditch light here is actually crooked. Uh, it's kind of facing out this way more than it really should be. So that could be contributing to why these uh, aren't really pointing the right way. Okay, so time to break it down. Uh, scale trains versus Intermountain Tier 4. Um, I tried to come up with some meaningful categories um, to try to run a realistic comparison between these two and uh, kind of what I came up with here. Not how, sure how well it shows in frame here. But uh, categories that I chose are price, uh, which is obviously a pretty big deal to a lot of folks. Um, details, accuracy, um, the sound decoder performance. Um, the motor or drivetrain pulling power, kind of that whole bit there, noise, speed, um, packaging, um, just because that's important because not all of us keep our models out 24-7 or not all of us put them on a layout and just throw away the packaging. Um, I like to run things for sometimes even an hour and then maybe I'll put it away and I won't run it again for a couple months or maybe I'll have it out for months at a time and then I'll put it away. But there's always a time where it's going to go back away again. So the ease of getting things in and out and making sure it's properly protected during that time is very important to me. And last thing would be availability. Uh, who cares how great of a model it is if you can't find it anywhere and you can't buy it or people are scalping them. So we're going to break it down here on the first category, which is price. Um, these are actually priced identically. Um, so on the inner mountains, typically they're about 225 with sound, about 150 without sound. That is pretty much equal to scale trains. Um, one thing that is pretty nice when you're ordering directly from scale trains is usually you do get free shipping versus inner mountain, depending on what dealer you're dealing with. Sometimes you may get charged taxes and shipping. Um, so, I mean, it's close enough that I really can't say that one's going to be any less than the other because maybe you can find even a better deal or a dealer, or maybe buy a couple of them and they'll give you a deal. Um, so on price, I'd have to say it's pretty much a draw um, just because pretty much all of the major sites that sell these sell them for exactly the same price. So going to have to say the first category of price is a draw. Second category, which is the details, accuracy of those details, quality of parts. So there are advantages and disadvantages of both here. So taking a look at some of the pros and cons on the scale trains first. Um, first and foremost um, on the scale trains, um, I do like the fact that it has the see-through grills on the back there. Uh, that's a pretty cool feature to have. Um, some of the disadvantages of it, um, obviously there's a little more waviness in the handrails. Um, on mine, it doesn't seem like the quality control was quite up to par. Um, there's some things that are, like on that front ditch light there, I don't know if I'm going to be able to fix that or not. Uh, kind of makes the model look kind of bad. Um, and as far as the underbody detail, I think the Intermountain is superior in the way that it has all the lines and piping here. Um, the shell removal, um, I didn't do on the scale trains, um, but I would assume that that's probably a bit easier just because on the Intermountain you have to detach the rear spring, which didn't even come off on my model and it seemed like it was glued on. Um, so it's probably never going to come off. Um, also on that, um, the Intermountain, like I said, the uh, LEDs, uh, the lighting is definitely better on the Intermountain. Um, there doesn't seem to be anything that's over or under scale on the Intermountain. Um, no real light bleed through, um, like on the front door there. So, I mean, on that part, I'd have to say the Intermountain's better. Um, the one the scale trains, it does have some underbody details. Um, it doesn't have the step lighting like Intermountain does. Not that that's a huge deal to me. It's not really something I'm going to use anyway. 
Um, quality and accuracy of the paint, pretty equal on both. I mean, they seem like they're pretty much made out of the same stuff. Um, the railings are maybe a tad bigger on the Intermountain, which is something that I would prefer. I don't like underscale details because they break easily, and uh, sometimes they don't even look like they're up to scale. I mean, on the BNSF here, I mean, everything's pretty uh, robust for being a plastic model. And I've not had any parts breakages on it, which is uh, pretty refreshing given my history with Intermountain. So on details, I'd have to say not by a whole lot, but I would give that nudge to Intermountain. So next category, sound and the uh, decoder performance. That I would have to give the edge here to scale trains, and that's just simply because there was no shell rattle out of the box, um, which is something that I had a problem with on the Intermountain. Also, the scale trains has a keep alive, at least on the sound equip model, which is a very, very nice feature. That's probably a $30 part alone for you to add that to the Intermountain. So on that, again, I'd have to uh, give that to the scale trains. Next category, the motor performance, quietness of the motor, pulling power, speed operation, smoothness. Um, these are both smooth engines. They're both quiet. Um, no real difference as far as flywheel hum at high speed. Um, both creep along pretty smoothly. Uh, no jerkiness, no hesitations there. Uh, the scale trains, as you saw, does pull better. So based probably on that one thing, I'd have to give the edge to scale trains here. Um, just because the rest of it's pretty much a dead heat. Next category, packaging. Um, this this is scale trains by a long shot. I absolutely hate the packaging that's on these new Tier 4 uh, Gevos from Intermountain. Uh, it is a real pain trying to get those screws back in there and hold your model at the same time without breaking any details. Uh, I absolutely hate that. Um, the scale trains uses kind of the industry standard that you see for uh, almost everybody, uh, Athern, um, trying to think some of the others here, MTH uses that on their Gevos, um, a lot of Bachman models use that, um, kind of across the board, um, almost everybody uses that style of packaging where it has some kind of like blister pack that snaps around it, and then there's a separate sleeve, and then you have foam around it in the box. It works, it's easy to take in and out, um, you have rail protectors in there also, so for that, I'd have to give that category to scale trains. And the next category would be availability. Um, so there's, these are kind of both available right now. Um, scale trains is going to be doing another run um, early 2018, which was what was noted on the paper. Um, scale trains does seem to have more schemes available. Um, however, they have more limited points of distribution, whereas most of your local hobby shops have a relationship with Intermountain. Uh, there's many, many websites out there that sell Intermountain. Um, Intermountain is doing different variants, some that have the uh, little hump here where it's slanted down, or this one here, which is an earlier one, which it's kind of flat. Mm -hmm. So they're both doing a lot of different ones. Um, I mean, as far as that goes, just because there's more points of distribution, I'd have to give the advantage to Intermountain on that. Um, so, really this results uh, in kind of a dead heat here. So, pretty much it's a draw on price. So, then really the only other things that we're going down the list here are these other things here. So I, it's, it's pretty much a dead heat there. But I have to say the better of the two, and uh, I did have some uh, preconceived notions about both of these, and honestly I'd have to say that I the Intermountain exceeded my expectations. Um, definitely I expected worse, given my previous experience with their uh, Gevos. And the scale trains, it, I wouldn't say that it let me down, but I did expect it to be closer or exceed the uh, Intermountain in quality, which it really did not. So it did fall a little bit short. Um, so with these, if it's a scheme that only one of them makes, like for instance, if you want one of the demonstrator units, you're going to have to go with uh, uh, scale trains because they're the only ones that do it. Um, whereas if you want maybe a scheme like BNSF, which both companies are making that, I would probably go with the Intermountain given a choice between the two of them. 
Um, so I'd have to say Intermountain um, out of the two of them at this point, despite not necessarily being the best in every category. It's just that the categories that it lost in, it didn't lose it by much. Um, and then the categories in which the scale trains lost in was uh, by a pretty significant margin. So there you have it. Um, I like the Intermountain better. Uh, never thought I'd be saying that, but I am. Um, so that's it for this video. A lot of stuff coming up. I would have done this one sooner, but I just got this model in the mail today. Been planning this video out for a couple weeks, but that's all for this one.